Kathleen, wh why don't you just address uh, some of the issues related to insurance reform? There is some agreement here, but I know that on the Republican side there are a couple of concerns about the issue of rate review, uh, the issue of setting up some benchmark standards that insurance companies have to abide by. Some people may think that those have been a little bit too aggressive. Um, you've been both a governor as well as an insurance commissioner. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, 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 about what you've seen at all those different levels and how you think we can best move forward to protect American families. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I know there are lots of people who want to comment on um, these topics, but I don't think there's any question, and I think there's a lot of agreement that the current insurance market really fails way too many people. It is a, a system that is not a market for about 40 million Americans who are either in an individual policy or in a small group policy have no choice. There is no competition, according to the American Medical Association, in their study yesterday, 99% of the market in metropolitan areas, 75% of the markets across the country are very concentrated, which means they're monopolies, they're not markets. So we got a trap. And um, I think the rules allow people to be locked out from the front end if you've got pre-existing conditions, allow people to be thrown out uh, with a stop on benefits during the course of a treatment or when your policy expires and you're supposed to renew, you're dumped out of the market, or to be priced out, which is going on across this country. The, there's been a highlight of a couple of rates, but double-digit rates across the country on top of double-digit rates on top of double-digit rates, and people have no choices. So the common areas, I think, of agreement, um, high-risk pools. There are lots of states across the country running high-risk pools. As an insurance commissioner, we ran the high-risk pool in Kansas. Uh, it is a strategy that's been in place for almost 30 years in many states. 200,000 people total in the entire United States uh, are in high-risk pools because they're so expensive that they really don't offer it. Because when you put all the sick people together and you say, okay, you get to buy a policy, and you get no help with that policy. Uh, it is a death spiral. You will always have the highest costs, and on top of that, the highest costs. And you've got the sickest people who are already paying the highest costs for treatment. Uh, they don't work very well. They are a stopgap measure that the House and Senate have proposed to get people from here to a new market. Um, I think what, what the exchanges have a lot in similarity with the um, health plans that have been talked about by the House and Senate, there's a big difference. And it's not a Washington difference, it's a state difference. The state insurance commissioners across this country have unanimously opposed health plans for decades. And uh, they feel that it takes people, it isn't the pooling that's objectionable, it's the fact that there is no consumer protection, that there is no ability to apply common sense rules. and. We had the drive-by deliveries uh, in Kansas where people were being kicked out of the hospital 18 hours after having a baby to save money, only to be readmitted with jaundice and to be readmitted with dehydration. It's not a particularly good idea. So getting rid of pre-existing conditions, uh, getting rid of uh, caps on uh, yearly benefits and long-time benefits, allowing kids to stay on plans are ideas that have been uh, accepted by both setting up a new marketplace, giving small business owners and individuals choice and competition in the private sector, but making the private sector operate on a different set of rules, including having some uh, loss benefit analysis. How many of those dollars, you heard uh, Senator Coburn eloquently talk about the 30 cents of every dollar that goes uh, to pay for expenses other than medical costs. A loss benefit analysis, a medical ratio would do just that. How many of your dollars are you actually spending uh, on provider care, on prescriptions, on treatments, and how much is going to overhead and CEO salaries and advertising uh, to try and get a handle on rates? Uh, having some rate review, having some transparency and some opportunity to have people make choices and make 
companies compete with one another and not separate the marketplace. I think the most dangerous part of the system right now is having people, uh, having insurance companies pick and choose who gets coverage and who doesn't based on your health condition. It's a lot cheaper to insure people who promise never to get sick. I watched it as insurance commissioner, but segregating that market is not insurance. It's not pooling a risk. And I think your proposal, Mr. President, gets back to the notion that there'd be a pool. There'd be an opportunity to pool that risk and have people have the kind of negotiating power as a governor. And like uh, Senator Alexander, I am a former governor. We both ran our state employee health pools. I don't know about Tennessee, but in Kansas, that was the largest pool in the state, 90,000 covered lives. We had a lot of negotiating power. We could get a pretty good deal on uh, a couple of companies competing on hospital rates, on doctor rates. Uh, that's what this kind of pooling mechanism and a new exchange would, would give everybody. And it's around a set of standards that made sense. Okay. Uh, Mr. President. Any, yeah, uh, Mr. Cantor, please. Eric. Mr. President, thank you again very much for having us and for staying with us for the six hours. Appreciate that. Uh, I don't know if you will after the six hours or not, but um, I, I, I guess, I guess let, let me just guess that that's the 2,400 page health care bill. Is that right? That, well, actually, Mr. President, this is the Senate bill. Uh, along with the 11 okay. page proposal that you put up online that really I think is the basis for the discussion here. So, um, I, but I, I do want to go back to your suggestion as to why we're here. And you suggested that maybe we are here to find some points of agreement to bridge the gap in our differences. Uh, and I, I, I do like to go back to basics. We're here because we Republicans care about health care just as the Democrats in this room. And when the speaker cites her letters from the folks in Michigan and the leader talks about the uh, letters he's received, Mr. Andrews his, all of us share the concerns when people are allegedly wronged in our health care system. I mean, I think that is sort of a given. We don't care for this bill. I, I think you know that. The American people don't care for the bill. I think that we've demonstrated uh, you know, the, in the polling that they don't. Uh, but there is, there is a reason why we all voted no. Uh, and it does have to do with the philosophical difference uh, that you point out. Uh, it does have to do with our fear that if you say that Washington can be the one to define essential health benefits, there may be a problem with that. And, and that's the language in the section 1302 of this bill, it, that it says that the secretary shall define for people what essential health benefits are. But let's, in, in the spirit of trying to come together, let, let's try and say maybe if, if we assume that Washington could do that, could really take the place of every American and decide what is most essential, what, what would be the consequences? And that's also where we have a big difference uh, of the, in, in this bill and what would happen. First of all, the cost. And John Kyle laid out um, the tremendous cost and the nearly trillion dollars uh, uh, of, of this bill. And I don't quite know because CBO said it couldn't assess how much your additions would cost to it. But we do know that there are plenty of taxes on income. Now you suggest investment income should be taxed. Uh, we have additional taxes on medical devices and the rest. What is the consequence of that? We know there are consequences that small businesses will feel because of the impact on job creation. Uh, but also, Mr. President, when we were here about a year ago across the street, you started the health care summit by saying one of the promises you want to make is that people ought to be able to keep the health insurance that they have. Because as we also know, most people in this country do have insurance, and overwhelming majority of people do like that coverage. It's just too expensive. Well, the CBO sent a letter, uh, I think it was to uh, Leader Reed, uh, about the Senate bill. Uh, and in that letter, it suggested that between 8 million and 9 million people uh, may very well lose the coverage that they have because of this, because of the construct of this bill. That, that's our concern. And so yeah. as, we are in, as we are in the market, uh, in, the, in the section of this discussion about health insurance reform, 
I know, Mr. President, that you have suggested strengthening oversight of insurance premium increases because we want to make sure that there aren't excessive insurance premium increases uh, that take place. The problem is when you start to mandate all of the essential benefits, there are going to be some insurance premium increases. None of us really want to see them, but if you stop them, who, who's going to pay for it? Well, when we get back to the fact that businesses won't be able to pay for it and people are going to lose their coverage. So I guess my question to you is, in the construct of this bill, um, if we want to find agreement, we really do need to set this aside. Um, and we really do need to say, okay, you know, the fundamental structure is something we can't agree on, but there are certainly plenty of areas of agreement. And because I don't think that you can answer the question in the positive to say that people will be able to maintain their coverage, people will be able to see the doctors they want in the kind of bill that you're proposing. Well, let, let, let me, since you asked me a question, let me respond. Um, the eight to nine million people that you refer to that might have to change their coverage, out, keep in mind out of the 300 million Americans that we're talking about, uh, would be folks who the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, estimates would, would find the deal in the exchange better, would be a better deal. So they, yes, they would change coverage because they've got more choice and competition. So let's just be clear about that point number one. Uh, point number two. You know, when we do props like this, you stack it up and you repeat 2,400 pages, et cetera. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that health care is very complicated. And we can try to pretend that it's not, but it is. Every single item that we've talked about on the Republican side, if we wanted to exhaustively deal with fraud and abuse, would generate a bunch of pages. So I, I, I point that out just because, you know, these are the kind of political things we do that prevent us from actually having a conversation. Now, l let, me, let me respond uh, to your question. Um, we could set up a system where food was probably cheaper than it is right now if we just eliminated meat inspectors. And, and we eliminated any regulations in terms of how food's distributed and how it's stored. I'll bet in terms of drug prices, we would definitely reduce prescription drug prices if we didn't have a drug administration that makes sure that we test the drugs so that they don't kill us. But we don't do that. We, uh, we, we, we make some decisions to protect consumers in every aspect of our lives. And we have bipartisan support for doing it, because what we don't want is a situation in which suddenly people think they're getting one thing and they're getting something else. They're harmed by a product. What Secretary Sebelius just referred to, which is not a Washington thing, in fact, state insurance standards in many states are higher than anything that's done in Washington, is as a consequence of seeing consistent abuses by the insurance companies and people finding themselves helpless to deal with them. Now, we can have a philosophical disagreement about how much insurance regulation is appropriate. What you've indicated to me, just based on the bills that I've seen, is you guys believe in some regulations. You already said you did. You believe in making sure that you can't just drop somebody with coverage. Now, if you don't have a law there, let me tell you, that happens all the time. I've got a bunch of stories in here of folks who thought they had insurance, got sick, the insurance company goes back and figures out a way to drop them. I I'm not making this up. I'm, I'm not trying to just add to the pages of that bill. It's in response to an actual problem, and you guys have agreed to it. So philosophically, at least, on a whole range of issues, you agree that we should have some insurance regulation. My suggestion had been that we try to focus on what are the specific regulations, since we agree that there have to be some, what are the specific ones that you object to? Now, let me just 
close by saying this. Pre-existing conditions is one that theoretically we all say we agree on. Theoretically, everybody thinks it's a bad deal if my wife's had breast cancer, I lose my job, I now try to buy insurance, and they say, well, you know what? Uh, if we're going to, we can't cover you because you, you, your wife has a history of cancer. We all think that's, that's a bad deal. There are two options, of, two ways of dealing with that. One is what Kathleen raised, which is a high risk pool. You could say, you know what? You can go in there and buy it in a big high risk pool. And by the way, you could probably set up a high risk pool without having as many pages of, uh, in the bill. And, it, and it's an option that's been around for 30 years. Here's the problem what happens is, the reason that all our rates as members of Congress or as elected officials are pretty low is we've got such a big pool, there are millions of federal workers, and as a consequence, any single one of us have cancer, any single one of us have a child with a disability, our costs are spread out over millions of people, and so all of us are able to keep our rates relatively low. Even though if any individual in that situation was trying to buy insurance, it would skyrocket. That's the concept of pooling, is you get the healthy people and the young people alongside the not so healthy and the older people. But we're all kind of spreading our risk, because each of us don't know at any given time what might happen. Maybe our kid's the one who gets diagnosed, heaven forbid, for something. And, and as a consequence, we insure ourselves by making sure that we're also insurance somebody else. When you get into something like a high-risk pool, what happens is all the sicker, older people are in that pool. All the younger people, they end up getting really cheap rates. And overall, you could say, well, that's how the market works. It's, it's a good thing. There's more choice. There's more choice for the young, healthy person, but not for the person who, heaven forbid, got sick. Now, on pre-existing conditions, we've got a similar situation. The challenge we have. I'd love to just pass a law that said, insurance companies, you can't, uh, you can't uh, exclude people be based on pre-existing conditions. The problem is, what they'll say to you is, well, you know what? Uh, what prevents somebody from not buying insurance until they get sick and then going in and just buying it and gaming the system? So we've tried to respond to a difficult problem uh, by saying, well, let's make sure everybody has some coverage. Without that, it's hard to do. So I just want to respond to, yes, we've got a philosophical objection, but let, let's not pretend that any form of regulation of the insurance market is somehow some onerous burden that's going to result in uh, terrible things happening to consumers. We, Ms. That's President, a good thing. Mr. President, if I could respond. It, Please. It, it, we, we, again, have a very difficult bridge to gap here, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I know that this is something that we don't want to look at, but these are, as you say, the complexities of what this is about. But when you start to mandate that everyone in this country have insurance, and you lay on top of that now the mandates that we all would like to see in a perfect world, there are consequences to that. We just can't afford this. I mean, that, that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate problem here, is in a perfect world, everyone would have everything they want. This government can't afford it. Businesses can't afford it. That's why we continue to say, go step by step, try and address the cost, and we could ultimately get there. But we're asking that you set aside this mandated form of insurance re regulate, re this mandated form of health care regulation, and let's go back to things we can agree on without this trillion dollar attempt here, that's all. I think the cost issue is legitimate, and whether we can afford it or not, we'll be discussing that. And I think that's an entirely legitimate discussion. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I, can I have 10 seconds? Literally 10 ahead. seconds. We don't have a philosophic disagreement. If you agree that you can't be dropped, there has to be dependent coverage, if there's no annual lifetime cap, then in fact you've acknowledged that it is the government's role. The question is how far to go. So this idea we have a fundamental philosophic difference, you're right. either in or you're out. You're oh. saying the government can't do it, none of it, or they can do some of it, we argue how much.
the, the cost issue is legitimate. Is we're we're, 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 we're going to address it. Uh, I want to, uh, Mr. President, if I could, just it's it's not ju it's the cost issue, but it's being driven by the fact that you've got in the bill, which I assume that your proposal supports, that the secretary define what a health benefit package should be. Only in the exchange. If it, it, it only as part of the pool that people who don't have health insurance would buy into. If you're you wouldn't. Uh, if you were working at a big company that already has a big pool, then they. they but but you know what? I, I want to. I want to make sure because Eric, we're we're going to end up in a, a, a back and forth that that cuts everybody else out. I've got uh, uh, on the Democratic side a uh, couple of people uh, that want to speak, and uh, there are probably some a couple of Republicans. We're already over time. I've burned some of it. I apologize. Uh, I'm going to go to Luis. Uh, then uh, to uh, Mike Enzi. Mike Enzi. Uh, I'll go to Tom Harkin and then uh, go back to Dave. Uh, and I'll, so I've got five speakers and I don't have a lot of time. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President, and thanks to all my colleagues for being here. I am pretty succinct and pretty timely. I will not take up a lot of time, but I sure do have to say some things. The first one is the pre-existing conditions absolutely has to go. It is cruel, it is capricious, and it is done only to ha enhance the bottom line. Uh, this was not even anything we talked about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, but I, it was mentioned that all Americans should be treated the same. Let me give you a little history on that. Eight states in this country right now have declared that uh, domestic violence is a pre-existing condition. On the grounds, I assume, that if you've been unlucky enough to get yourself beaten up once, you might go around and do it again. 48% is the higher cost for women, in many cases, to buy their own insurance. Believe you me, that is really uh, discriminatory. Uh, in 1991, women were not included in any of the trials at the NIH because we had hormones. It wasn't until we had a critical mass of women here that said this will not do for more than half the population of the United States who pay taxes that we made certain that diseases like uh, osteoporosis, mainly a woman's disease, cervical cancer, only a woman's disease, uterine cancer, and others were really looked at. Up to that point, 1991, all research at the Institutes of Health was done on white males. Now, think about that for a minute, if you will. We couldn't do that because we said, kindly, would you stop doing that? It took legislation. Doing this will take legislation. I've been through this before. I was here when we had the Clinton debate. It was started, some of you will remember, by Lee Iacocca, who said we cannot export our automobiles. There is a $1,000 cost for health care in every one of them. My competitors are way ahead of me. They are eating my lunch. That was one of the main reasons, Mr. President, if you recall, that we decided we had to do something about that. In the 13, 15 years since that's happened, we have done nothing about health care. We don't export so much anymore. The automobile business is basically gone. We have done nothing to encourage entrepreneurs. The speaker spoke of this this morning. We need to think more about the economic benefits of doing this. Those of us who are trying to redo some trade policies and maybe let us make something else again in the United States really want to make sure that it succeeds. And this would be a great part of that. I think it's terribly important that, that, that we do that. Uh, also, since the Clinton health care plan, we've seen some pretty awful things. We saw hospitals abandoned to the streets, critically ill, elderly, mentally ill persons. And there was no great hue and cry out there. And now I understand there is actually a proposal, which God knows I hope never sees the light of day, that shut down Medicare and turn that into a voucher system. And where obviously we would not pay the full cost of health care, as these poor people have to go to the public market and try to find some. So what are we going to be doing then? We're going to be once again abandoning our elderly, abandoning our mentally ill, and are seriously ill to the streets. We're better people than that. I think it, it would be really a good thing for us today while we're here in this room together to really think about what's absolutely important here. 
not nitpick over little pieces of this and that, but think about all the people out there every single day. The number of people with excess deaths because they have no health insurance. I even had one constituent, you will not believe this, and I know you won't, but it's true. Her sister died. This poor woman had no dentures. She wore her dead sister's teeth which of course were uncomfortable and did not fit. Do you ever believe that in America that that's where we would be? This is the last chance as far as I'm concerned, particularly on the export business. We have fallen behind. We're no longer the biggest manufacturer in the world. We've lost our technological edge. We have an opportunity to do that, but a major part of the success of that is getting this health care bill passed. Thank you very much. Louise, thank you. I, I was just informed, uh, and, and by the way, uh, this has been a terrific conversation so far. Um, the House had to schedule a vote on an item, uh, and my understanding is it has already started. So what I'd like to do is this. Um, we've got four remaining speakers, Mike, uh, Enzi, uh, Dave Camp, I guess, again, uh, and uh, as well as Tom Harkin, and, uh, four remaining speakers, and, and, and Jay Rockefeller. What I'd like to do is to break so that the House can take the vote. When we come back, we will start with Mike and we will return to finish up the issue of uh, insurance reform. And then we will move on uh, to the questions of coverage. There were several people who were still in the queue uh, who didn't have a chance to speak uh, prior to us breaking. Uh, the topic was still insurance reform, although obviously these things interrelate and I suspect that people may uh, you know, have some other issues that they want to raise. Um, after this, uh, we're going to go to the issue of deficit, and uh, which touches on some of the issues related to Medicare that have been raised already. And I'm going to actually have uh, Joe Biden uh, open that up. Well, no, no. I mean, we we will be we will be talking about health reform, Charlie. I, I guarantee you, you will be called on before. Uh, uh, you, you'll have a chance to talk about all these issues. All right, um, Mr. President. What time do you expect to end the meeting? My hope is that we get out of here. We're we're running a little bit late, but for uh, having a lot of elected officials sitting around a table, we're not too late. Uh, um, my hope is, is that we can adjourn by 4.15. All right? Okay. 4.15. Originally, it was scheduled to go to 4. We're starting a little bit late on this front. Uh, you know, so, so we'll see if we can get out here by 4.15. All right? That will require probably a little more discipline on all our parts, including myself, than uh, was shown in the morning session. Although, uh, let me just say that I thought the tone of the discussion was uh, uh, helpful, and I appreciate everybody's participation so far. Uh, with that, I'm going to go to uh, Mike Lindsay. Uh, and I'm going to go to. As long as you're talking about leaving, Mr. President, please put me on the list. Well, I guarantee you, you guys are all going to have a chance to speak. Um, so, but uh, we're going to go to Mike Enzi, uh, and then we're going to go to Tom Harkin. I know that uh, we had uh, Jay Rockefeller was still on the list. Uh, was there another uh, Republican uh, that wanted to speak just on the insurance reform issues, or you, you want to go to John Barrazzo? Uh, or well, uh, all right, we'll, we'll let we'll let you guys uh, split time on this one. All right, Mike. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, colleagues. Uh, when we're when we're talking about insurance reform, we haven't really talked about, but but Representative Slaughter kind of opened the door on it, and that's Medicare. Um, seniors out there are really nervous. Seniors are the ones objecting the most to the program, and it's because they see half a trillion dollars coming out of their program. If Medicare were separate and any savings that we did in Medicare reform went back into Medicare, it would do a lot to uh, relieve the tension that's out there. It'd even be a way to pay for the doc fix. So I'm, I'm hoping that that can be uh, a piece of what we're doing. I really appreciate this exchange. It, it would have been helpful had we had this nine months or a year earlier and had it in even more detail and for more days. Um, what we were presented with in the HELP Committee, of course, was a bill that was already half-drafted. 
and we started the markup on it, and then we got the other half later. And since we had not had any input to the drafting, we're credited with 150 amendments. Well, 17 of those amendments were Senator Murkowski, uh, where she was inserting Native Americans and tribal in, in 17 different places. I had 11 of them where we put in a, a thing that required agencies to cooperate. So um, the ideas that we had, we, I, when Senator Kennedy and I were working bills, um, we'd set down some principles and then put some detail in and then draft the bills together. And uh, I, I hope that that's something that we go to on, on future bills. It works. In a three-year period, he and I got 38 bills signed by the president. Uh, uh, in the last year, I've gotten two that I've gotten pens from this president, and uh, the way that we've done those has been through that kind of that kind of a process. And uh, <coughs> unless we go through that kind of a process, I don't think we're going to. I, I don't think we can get to the bipartisan thing. And that's what the purpose of this meeting is: is to kind of get all these ideas together and see how they gel. Uh, in insurance reform, small business health plans, that's different than the AHPs, which is what they were, they were talking about, and it covers some of the problems that were talked about. Uh, one of the problems is mandates, and uh, Olympia Snow contributed to that part. She had a, a provision that if 26 of the states adopted a mandate, it would be a mandate nationwide. Uh, and as other mandates became 26, they'd be included with it too. Um, we talked about health savings accounts. Um, I, I don't think that meets some of the federal minimum standards that the, that the federal government might put on it. And that's going to disappoint some of our employees because that is one of the options that federal employees have, is health savings accounts. And it's particularly good for the younger, healthier people. Uh, they can get that. They've got catastrophic coverage. If they put the amount of money that they would have spent on a Blue Cross plan or some other plan, the difference between the two, into a savings account, in three years they've covered the huge deductible. And they can continue to do that tax-free. So it's a, it's a process that would uh, be really objected to if it's excluded or, or changed. Um, I like the exchanges. And the reason I like the exchanges is it's, it's kind of a form of bidding. It, it's more transparency. People can see what they're buying. And that would be a big help. When we were in the shoe business, my wife used to, after 10 years, she decided she'd bid out our insurance. We didn't know there was that much flexibility in insurance. She saved a bunch. And then, of course, she didn't, since we were selling shoes, it's kind of a fixed price. So she didn't really take the low bid and then go back to somebody else and say, can you make this a little lower? But that insurance company we'd been with for 10 years came to us and said, we could have done a better deal. She said, you should have when I was buying the insurance. And uh, we got much better, much better bids the next year. So these, these exchanges can be good. But what I would hope you would consider is having the exchanges to list anybody's insurance that wants to put it on there. And then mark the ones that meet the federal minimum standards so that people can decide really what, what's out there in the market. And, and I think it would pull up some of the ones that are lower down up into the category. Uh, and at the same time, everybody could see what all is on the market out there, uh, and hopefully regardless of states. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, and, and thanks for staying uh, uh, succinct. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and I thought uh, you, you shared some important ideas there. Uh, Tom Harkin. Mr. President, thank you again for bringing us together uh, today. I think, uh, if, if anything, what I've learned here so far is that, uh, quite frankly, we may be closer together than people really think in actually getting agreement uh, that we can move forward on. I hope that's the case. There's been a lot of uh, figures thrown out here and a lot of process things, but I keep thinking we've got to bring it back home to what this is all about. We all have our stories. I, I got a letter yesterday from a farmer in Iowa. It really encapsulated this. I'm a 57-year-old Iowa farmer. I'm writing to voice my concern regarding my family's rapidly escalating health care costs. On Saturday, February 20th, I received a notice from Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa informing me that our health insurance premium will be increasing $193.90 per month to a monthly total of $1,516.20. This is a 14.6% increase and will result in a yearly cost of $18,194.40 for a family of four. Ten years ago, our monthly health insurance premium was $373.50 per month 
for a similar policy which had a lower deductible and covered three additional children. Health care costs are out of control and as a self-employed individual I feel powerless. At the current rate of increase, by the time I reach Medicare age, my premiums will cost $42,000 per year. As a farmer, I manage risk on a daily basis. Weather, weeds, insects, and fluctuating commodity prices. I have not yet found a way to control my exposure to health care expenses. Because of pre-existing conditions, I've been denied access to coverage under more economical insurance plans. Therefore, I'm stuck in, a, in an expensive pool and have few options. The best option would be for the U.S. Congress to pass comprehensive health care reform, resulting in affordable health care for all. The health of my family and the future of my small business depends on it. Sincerely, Raymond Smith, Buffalo Center, Iowa. Mr. President, we spent, I hear talk about, well, we've got to start over and do all this thing again. You know, we spent one year considering a range of ideas from experts from all over the political spectrum. Two committees, the HELP Committee under the able leadership of Senator Dodd, the Finance Committee under the leadership of Senator Baucus, held over 100 bipartisan meetings and walkthroughs to discuss this bill. Our bill contains over 147 distinct Republican amendments. Now on the issue of health insurance reform, of the 10 key elements in the House bill, we have nine of them in our bill. Nine out of 10, that's not bad. The only one that's missing is the, is the uh, health savings accounts. But nine out of 10 are in our bill that are in the House Republicans bill. Now again, those what are they? You know, again, pre-existing conditions, we covered that. No rescission when you get sick. No lifetime annual caps. No gender-based ratings. Keeping your kids on until they're age 26. That's in the House Republican bill. That's in our bill. So I think we're very, we're, we're, very, we're very close on this. Last two things I just want to address myself to is this idea that somehow we can do a little bit. We can take an incremental type of an approach. Somehow we can do insurance reforms, but we don't have to do anything else. Well, quite frankly, if we want insurance reforms, you can only do that if everybody's in the pool. You can only get everybody in the pool if you make it affordable for middle class families and others. You can only make it affordable for middle class families and others if you have cost controls. What I'm saying, Mr. President, and others, is this all hangs together. You can't pick one out and do it without doing it all together. It all hangs together. Cases in point. Some states in the 90s tried to do health insurance reform without doing anything else. And they found it to be a debacle because the insurance premiums skyrocketed. New Hampshire, Kentucky, and Washington were forced to repeal their reforms because of that. Case in point, Massachusetts in the 90s put in uh, health insurance reforms or anything else. Individual market premiums doubled. Four years ago when they did their comprehensive reform and they put the package together, premiums dropped by 40% in Massachusetts. That's why you can't do this incremental approach. Every time I hear about, you know, we're sinking, we're drowning in this country on health care. An incremental approach is like a swimmer who's 50 feet offshore drowning and you throw him a 10 foot rope. You say, well, it didn't reach him, but we'll get it back in. We'll throw him a 20 foot rope next time. Then we'll throw him a 30 foot. And a 40. By that time, the swimmer's drowned. And that's what's going to happen to Ray Smith and so many other families in this country. They're going to drown. By the time, if we do this kind of incremental type of an approach that I hear others talking about. Lastly, uh, I'd like to put this in a different kind of a contextual framework. We don't allow segregation in our country on the basis of race, creed, color, national origin, etc. 20 years ago this year, we also said we're not going to allow segregation on the basis of disability when we passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. And yet, we still allow segregation in America today on the basis of your health. Why should we? Why should we? 
allow that to happen. It's time to stop segregating people on the basis of their health. That's why insurance reform is so vital, because the health insurance industry in this country is based on a flaw. And the flaw is their ratings are based on segregating people because of their health. Think about that. Whenever I hear the word pool, this pool, that pool, this pool, I think segregation. You're segregating people out because of their health status. I think it's time to end that. I sold insurance. I was an insurance agent when I was a young man. And there's one principle of insurance I learned then that I've never forgotten. The more people in the pool, cheaper it is for everybody. You start setting up these pools, you're going to make it more expensive, and you're going to be segregating people on the basis of health. Let's think about that. It's time to stop that kind of segregation in our country. All right. Tom, uh, the, uh, Dave Kane. Thank you very much. Uh, on the issue of insurance reform and pre-existing conditions, there are responsible ways to solve this problem and reduce the cost of health insurance for everyone. And we support state universal access programs that address high-risk pools and reinsurance that makes affordable coverage available to those who are sick and those who have a pre-existing condition. And I won't go all of those through all of those things that Dr. Bustani and others here have talked about. But, um, and our, our approaches are somewhat similar on this issue uh, pre-2014 in the period where uh, the House and Senate bills are wrapping up, but uh, ramping up, but they are, there is a, a pretty big distinction. And uh, that is that there's a key difference in the approaches. Uh, we prevent waiting lists during that period. And we have these programs managed by the state level, and they're robust enough that CBO has scored that they'll be effective. And what, what the House and Senate approaches are is that those rules are set in Washington. And the House and Senate bills are similar in that if you look at the Senate bill on page 48, 51, and 52, it's the unelected Secretary of Health and Human Services who has the authority to establish waiting periods for access to these programs, raise premiums, reduce benefits. And so it is a very, well, we are similar in what we talk about. There's a very key different uh, approach there. And uh, then uh, after 2014, when the bill fully comes into play, uh, you have uh, a, a very different approach there. And uh, what you do is establish pre-existing condition and link it with the individual mandate. And the American people have told us they don't want to be forced to buy health insurance that they don't want and they can't afford. And this is a significant issue across the country. And the American people are telling us that, that the individual man the mandates, the requirements to buy insurance, are, are something that they want us to scrap and start over on. And that's why you're seeing state legislatures around the country passing resolutions saying our citizens are going to have a choice on whether they buy health care. They're going to have a choice on the kind of coverage they want to have. And so this is a fundamental difference in this area of insurance reform that I think we, we, have, to, we have to really begin again and really take into what the American people are saying and expressing this through their elected representatives and the state legislators. I know there's a lot of former state legislators here. I'm one as well, and I think that's a very serious point that we need to address. I'll just uh, touch on, on your last point, which is the, the whole issue of pre-existing conditions. Tom Harkin mentioned it, but I, and I'm, I'll be very brief because I know that we've got to move on uh, to the next topic. Um, the, the way I understand uh, Leader Boehner's bill works, and I think that's the one you're referring to, uh, the way you deal with a pre-existing condition is to essentially set up a high-risk pool. I mean, that, that's the mechanism. Uh, so what you're saying is if you're sick or older or you got hip replacements or what have you, and you're having trouble buying insurance on the open market, you're going to be able to buy into a high-risk pool. Now, t Tom made the point earlier that, and, and this is indisputable, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with this, that if you set up a high-risk pool in which you don't have healthy people, younger people in the same pool as older, sicker people, the premiums for the older, sick, sicker people who've been segregated into this pool is just going to be higher. Now. 
I, I have, you know, we looked at the Boehner bill uh, to see sort of how you approach that. Um, and you've got some reinsurance. And keep in mind, we use a high risk pool as well until we get to the exchange. And we have reinsurance, for example, for federal uh, or, or for uh, people who uh, are on retiree plans. We want to help employers maintain those uh, plans. Uh, and they've got an older population, so uh, we want to help uh, reinsure them. Uh, but uh, the, given the amount of money that you have allocated for that pool, it's just not going to be a very uh, uh, useful tool for the vast majority of people who've got pre-existing conditions, just because there's just not enough money that you guys put into it to be able to cover all the people with pre-existing conditions, which is why other states have high-risk pools, Kathleen mentioned. Uh, there, there are, I don't know how many states, but let's say 20, 21 states currently have high-risk pools. Out of all those 21 states, about 200,000 people use the high-risk pool. And the reason is because uh, by just dealing with older, uh, less healthy individuals separately, or people with pre-existing conditions, uh, it is very, very expensive. Tom's point was if everybody's in it, because presumably none of us know at any given moment who's going to end up being healthy and who's not, we don't know whether our kids are going to be uh, suffering some sort of uh, disease uh, that we don't anticipate yet, or you know, our spouses get ill, that if everybody's in it, then that drives prices down cheaper for everybody. So it's not that I think that the high-risk pool idea is a bad one. As I said, the House, the Senate bill, the bill, uh, the proposal that I put forward, all use the high-risk pool as a stopgap measure to get to a broader pool, but the goal has to be to get everybody in, in a, a place where those risks are spread more broadly. And, and if I just might say, mm -hmm. uh, we support high risk pools and reinsurance with $25 billion in funding. Right. Uh, the House and Senate versions are $5 billion in funding. And because of that robust support, CBO says this will work. The, the fundamental difference after that is that the Health and Human Services Secretary in that four-year period when they're somewhat similar has the authority to raise the premium. So all of that, all of that is brought to Washington. We, we leave that authority in the states so that they can manage their state pools. And then after the bill becomes effective in 2014, the real problem becomes this individual, the mandate and the cost, of the, the forcing of, of the purchase of insurance, which many Americans find objectionable. And, and that you can avoid that mandate if you continue to design this as we do in the beginning. Well, uh, the, oh, and both okay. plans uh, are somewhat similar on that, but it's a very different right. structure. Um, what, what, what I'd like to do is to move on to the topic, which I think Jay underlies. Jay Rockefeller. Oh, I'm sorry. We still got Jay. My apologies. Jay, please go ahead. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, one of the we really haven't discussed, I think, what is at the basis of the frustration about this whole business of, of pre-existing conditions and lifetime limits, all the rest of it. And that is the way and the nature of the health insurance industry, for the most part. Mm -hmm. They are among all industries I've ever encountered. And in the Commerce Committee, we have spent a year analyzing and bringing out some of their sins and ills. Um, they're terrible. They're in it for the money. A nice lady who runs WellPoint said, we will not sacrifice profitability for membership. Money first, people second. Uh, they, we had a, a fellow named Wendell Potter who worked for Cigna for 20 years as a high executive. He came before us on his own, volunteered, and described the way health insurance companies operate. They are looking for reasons <laughs> to kick you out. They are looking for reasons, if you already have the health insurance, for doing the rescissions. Uh, yes, we're going to ban those, but not unless we pass a bill. And in fact, often employees are incentivized financially to find reasons 
to kick people off of the insurance which they're paying for. So you can be paying your premiums, and then they discover they come up with something uh, they found in your background they don't like, and they just kick you off. They can do that now legally. And so people say, well, you know, um, maybe the states ought to do this. They can do it better. Well, that's the situation we have now. But 44 of, those, 44 of the 50 states make it perfectly legal for health insurance companies to do this pre-existing condition, to simply deny coverage for something which people just got sick, as babies or as adults or whatever. Um, I got a letter from the, the, the CEO of Cigna uh, written to me. And um, he said, I want to apologize uh, because um, we, we had said that we'd spent $5 billion on the small group insurance market. Well, I checked a little bit more. In fact, we hadn't. Now, why, why don't people know that? Because the, the health insurance industry is the, is the shark that swims just below the water. And you don't see that shark until you feel the teeth of that shark. Now, unless I'd be accused of trying to over-dramatize my statement, this is the way they operate. Nobody has particular oversight of them. They're not under any uh, antitrust uh, type rules. They can do what they want. They so dominate the market, as, uh, as the secretary pointed out, that there really isn't any real competition. They can do what they want, and they do. And it's money. It's money. And it, it makes me sick. It shouldn't happen in America. People say, well, government run. You're going to do this or put that restriction on them. If you don't put the restriction on them, they're going to go on doing this. And so, you know, the, the public option was, uh, I, I like that a lot, but that's not going to probably be possible. So you have, you have to go at them to clip their wings in every way that you can. And that's why, and with his general agreement on pre-existing conditions and, and rescissions and, and lifetime annual limits, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a lot of fun to see an eight-year-old kid, which I have done, and I knew this kid, Samuel Board, and he had leukemia, and, um, and, and he had life, you know, annual limits, and he ran out, and, and then he died because there was no insurance. Could they have cured his cancer? I don't know. But that's what insurance is for. So this is a rapacious industry that does what it wants, unknown in their behavior to the people of America, except on an individual basis. An individual can't shake up us uh, the way they're now doing it, I think. So when you, when you talk about the individual mandate, that's not in there for some government makes that decision purpose. It's there because you've got to have a big pool. Everybody's made that point. I got a son who's old enough to have health insurance. He doesn't have it. And when my wife and I found out about it, we told him to get it the next day. He didn't think he needed to have it. He would live forever. Well, that's, of course, that's the, that's the premise among young people. That's why we have uh, the, the requirement that people sign up for health insurance. And they don't know if they're going to need it. And he doesn't know that he's going to need it. So you make everybody participate, and then you have a bigger risk pool. You can do a better job. I want to say one word about uh, medical loss ratio, because it's a, sort of a crazy name. But it's a really good concept. Uh, what we say is that the health insurance industry in Sunday says that they, they spent 87% of all of their revenues from premiums or any investment that they might have on health care. That doesn't work out quite that way. For large businesses, they do a much better job. But for small businesses and the individual market, they're down in West Virginia in the high 60s and the low 70s. So how do you stop that? There's, you can't stop that by asking them to. You stop that by having a law, which is a good law saying that you have to spend between 80 and 85 percent of everything you take in in revenue on medical care for your patients. And if you don't, we will know about it, because we'll be tracking it. And then you have to rebate that difference to the people. 
So there's, there's a reason for doing that. It's good public policy. It can't just happen on a voluntary basis. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, but it's a way to make sure you get your objective. Uh, let me just close on one, one other issue. The, um, the rate review, and I, I wish we could talk about the, uh, the, the Medicare board, advisory Medicare board, which is controversial, but which is a Well, we will have a chance to talk about it next. So, we'll, Jay, let's, uh, let's wrap it up, because I want to make sure I'm going to wrap it up. Um, the um, insurance rate review is important. And if Kathleen Sebelius is to be in, uh, called a, an unelected person, and she's head of the group that does all of Medicaid and Medicare and Health and Human Services, and she's been an insurance commissioner, she's been a governor, she knows the whole thing. I, I don't call her down because she's not elected, but was appointed by you, and it was a brilliant choice. People say decisions can't all come from Washington. Sometimes decisions have to come from Washington because what we're about here is not trying to run by government. We're trying to protect consumers. And if you're going to protect consumers, you've got to have a way that they really do get protection and that they know it and that they feel it in their lives. So this, is, this, is, um, this insurance reform is important. Uh, it's a profoundly emotional subject out there. And we got to do something about it. Mr. President, Mr. President, Ms. Blackburn was, was, was on the list, I thought, before we left. OK, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And yes, uh, one of the points that we did want to cover today was the across state line purchasing mm -hmm. of insurance. You've alluded to that a couple of times and uh, mentioned that you felt like we were close on that issue. I think that there are some very important structural differences in the way we approach this, just as I think that there are very deep philosophical differences in how we approach health care reform. Now, a lot of the people that I talk to want us to start over in this issue, and they want us to give them the ability to hold insurance companies accountable. One of those ways is through very robust competition. Mm -hmm. And when you have a district like mine in Tennessee where the bulk of our constituents are within 15 miles of a state line, the ability for those individuals who have families and live and work and have employees on the other side of the state line who shop for major purchases every day is to allow them to be able to make those purchases. Also, when you talk about holding insurance companies accountable, if you want to empower patients in front of those insurance companies, take the power away from them, then give them the ability to buy a policy that suits their needs. They are really uh, tired of paying for coverage they don't want. If you want to prevent premium acceleration, uh, such as the issue in California right now, where the premiums have gone up 39%, if you are siding with protecting those insurance companies and not allowing across state line competition, then what you're doing is denying Californians the ability to go to Oregon where they could buy a policy for 25% less. Or individuals in New Jersey who could go to Pennsylvania and buy a policy and lower their cost 26% or go to Wisconsin and buy one and lower their cost 74%. Now, some of the very differences in our bill, we have a way to do this without putting a federal bureaucracy in charge of it. States can already do compacts, but the Senate bill legislation would require state action and then federal approval for those compacts to take place. There's another important point here. The bill that you all are proposing would not put these in place until 2016. And quite frankly, I think a lot of the American people agree with us that care delayed and access delayed is care and access denied. And they would like to see those, basically what you have, state lines right now basically have stop signs up 
when it comes to across state line access. They would like to see that come down and like to see those access portals opened up so that they can first lower their cost, secondly, so that they have greater ability to hold insurance companies accountable, and then also state legislators, even some of our governors, many of the governors favor approaching this model and allowing uh, our constituents a way to access this, get the cost down, and I will be brief so that we can move on to other topics. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that very much, Marcia. Just, just to close, because there, there have been two issues that were raised. One, the purchasing insurance across state lines, and the other was the issue of the mandate, and I just want to address those very briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Um, I support the idea of uh, purchasing insurance across state lines, and you're right that the way we structure it is to have compacts between states so that you start getting a regional market. But I think there are two things that are important to understand. Number one, uh, with respect to California, for example, the problem, as was presented yesterday in California, was not that there were a whole bunch of insurance companies from other states who were clamoring in to get into California to sell insurance to those individuals who saw their premiums spike by 39 uh, percent. There weren't. The problem has to do with the fact, according to them, that people who have lost their jobs now, who are healthy and can't afford the individual market, have basically just decided, I'm going to go without insurance. I'll see, yeah, I, I got to take my chances because I just can't afford it. What that's left is people who, because of pre-existing conditions, because of special health care needs, because of age, they have to keep their insurance. And so the pool has become older and sicker. Now, the way to get at that problem is actually what we've discussed earlier, which is to broaden the pool, make sure everybody's in the pool. Uh, and that's what the exchanges do. I actually think that on the purchasing uh, insurance across state lines, there may be a way of resolving the philosophical difference. <coughs> Not entirely, but, but there's a potential way of bridging this gap, and that is to say that once there was a national exchange with some minimum um, standards, then potentially you could just have an, a national marketplace and anybody could be able to sell into the exchange. This is something that Mike Enzi just mentioned. I actually think that could be workable once the exchange was stood up. So there may be a way of bridging this difference. Yeah. Now, on, on the mandate, though, because the mandate issue is connected, and so I'm just going to mention this real quickly, and then I will move on. Um, when I ran uh, in the Democratic primary, I was opposed to the mandate. Um, Bless you. Well, and, and I'll, because my theory was, you know what, people, the reason they don't have health insurance isn't because somebody's not telling them to get it, but because they just can't afford it. And that if we lowered costs enough, then everybody would be able to get it. Uh, so I was dragged kicking and screaming to the conclusion that uh, I arrived at, which is, is that it makes sense for us to have everybody purchase Insurance, And I have to say, this is not a Democratic idea. I mean, there are a number of Republicans sitting around this table who have previously supported the idea of an individual mandate, responsibility. The reason I came to this conclusion is twofold. One is cost shifting, which is a fancy term for saying everybody here who has health insurance is one way or another paying for those who don't. Every time somebody goes into the emergency room, if Jay's son got hit by a bus, and his dad wasn't Jay Rockefeller, uh, and he ends up in the emergency room, uh, we'd give him <clears throat> emergency treatment, and we'd all pick up the tab. And the calculation, not our calculation, but independent economists, is that each family with health insurance right now is picking up $1,000 to $1,100 worth of costs for people who don't have health insurance. 
So when Tom Coburn earlier said, you know, if, if a kid comes to the emergency room, they're going to get treated. Yeah, yeah they, they will get treated. Who's paying for it? Well, we're paying for it. Every American family who's got health insurance is paid for it. Every employer who is covering their employees is paying for it. So we're already putting the money in. It's just in a very inefficient way. Uh, and so the notion that somehow uh, if we don't ask people to carry their responsibilities that we're saving money. No, we're not saving money. It's just we don't see it. It's, it's called uncompensated care, and we all get charged an extra thousand bucks. So that's part of the reason. The second reason has to do with the issue of pre-existing conditions in the pool that we've already discussed. But I just wanted to address those two issues. Yeah. Marcia, you had uh, one thing uh, that yes. you wanted to respond to. Yes, and, Mr. Uh, President, I did very quickly. I would just suggest that we're looking at this from, in your example, we're looking at it the wrong way. You're talking about letting companies into California. I'm talking about letting individuals out. No, it's a, but, but it's, 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 the same, it's the same idea, Marsha. It doesn't matter whether the companies are going in or people going out. I promise you. Free it, it up. It, no, no, no. Free it up. I, I promise you that the, uh, uh, the problem that's going on in California is going on in every state. It, it's not unique to California. It's not as if there are insurance companies that are given great deals in Iowa. That gentleman farmer who just talked about it, these are some structural problems that exist in every state. Uh, so the, 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 it, it, is, it is what is true. Yes. Let him no, I, I want to say this. Hold on a second, guys. What is absolutely true is that some states probably have higher mandates than others. And so you can probably attribute a certain amount of the cost in a high, you know, a state that has more requirements for bare minimum coverage, doesn't allow you know, drive by uh, deliveries or requires mammograms or what have you. Those things all may add some incremental cost. But the truth of the matter is, is that that's not the reason that you're seeing such problems. In a lot of states, the problem is just you don't have competition at all. We want competition. We just want some minimum standards.